If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. On Horse Chats today, we're going to talk to Nancy Zintmaster about the Resnick Method. But before we get started, I'd just like to remind you about the values of International Horse College. Horse welfare and safety are of utmost importance when humans have any interaction with horses. Within the courses at International Horse College, we only utilise methods that promote safe and humane ways of interaction between horses and humans. And we only support safe methods of educating riders, handlers and trainers in all our courses. Have a look now, internationalhorsecollege.com, registered training organisation 31352. Now, Nancy, are you there? I am. Wonderful to talk to you today. And we're going to talk about the Resnick methods. But before we get started, I think you're going to tell us about a quote that you often use. Yes, I do have a favorite quote. It's kind of, I think, how I've been leading my life for all these years. <laughs> and, um, uh, and that is a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And the quote is, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. So I kind of feel like it's apropos because I, I feel like, you know, that's what we're all trying to do with horses when we're trying to educate people to give horses a better deal, right? I think we do. I think we keep trying to evolve horses, you know, evolve them when you think that we first started off eating horses and yeah. then we, you know, used them in war and in work and, and as machinery and the Industrial Revolution took over, now we use them for pleasure, but then we've gone that one step further and we're using horses to assist us in other areas of our life. So I think we've really, we just keep evolving horses. You know, they're still the same animal, they're still all the same positive attributions, but we, we're we finding a lot better and more uses for them. Absolutely, mm -hmm. totally agree with that. Nancy, I often start people off by their favourite saying, you know, because they tell us a lot about themselves within those sayings. But tell us a little bit more. Now, you're talking about the Resnick method today. And, uh, you know, I often talk about people, how they started with horses. But how did you come across this method that you want to talk about, the Resnick method? Yes, well, um, I've, I've always uh, had a passion for horses. My grandfather actually uh, had a breeding farm, a Welsh pony breeding farm as I grew up. And from four years old, I was always uh, obsessed with, with horses. And he was quite a sweet horse whisperer kind of gentle person. But we were still taught way back then, you know, to, you know, the horse has to do what you say. And it was a more dominant way, I think, of being with horses than I ever you know, felt comfortable with. So the years went by and I kind of developed my own way of being with horses and it was quite magical. I just had a really strong, deep connection with horses and I never really had to train them. I just spent a lot of time with them and um, just kind of always seemed like a friendship and it just always just was, we were in the flow, you know? And so as a lot of women, um, you know, what happens is, you know, we grow up, we have to go to college and then we get married and we have children. And there was a little break in my life where I did not have horses. And I lived in Key West, Florida, so there wasn't much of an opportunity to have horses on this island. But my husband actually um, wanted to retire in Costa Rica. So I said, you know, I'm game for that, but there's one deal <laughs> I'm going to make with you, and that is that I can have horses again. So, of course, he said yes, and 20 years ago, we moved to Costa Rica, and I got into horses again, and little did I know, you know, here in this country, horses are viewed a little bit differently. They're used for work, much like it was way back when, when, you know, they were farm help. They're more t as used as tools, not by everyone, but by a lot of people. It's how they earn money on tours and things like that, and so I got my first horse. And then I rescued a second horse and everything was going great and I had no problems. Then I ran into a herd of four horses. It was a mare and her three offspring that were shut down, starving. The mare was nursing the baby and she was skin and bones. She was eating rocks. 
So my husband and I just, of course, went into rescue mode. We rescued the entire herd. And um, then I got very attached to the horses. And also over this year of rehabilitating them health-wise, you know, they became a united herd with my herd. And from what I knew about horses, I just didn't really want to break that up. So I started doing equine retreats to bring in like-minded clinicians to help me connect with these shutdown horses because they actually wanted nothing to do with humans and they were checked out. So, and it was different for me because I had never experienced that level of checked out, you know, and I really didn't know what to do. I never had a lot of formal training or anything as a trainer. I just always kind of knew what to do. So I reached out to numerous people and I had these beautiful week-long retreats and clinicians came, but my horses were not having any of it. They were like, "Mm mm-mm, you know, this isn't for me. It was a lot of different types of trainings that were quite gentle, actually, but they didn't like it. And finally, I got a hold of Carolyn Resnick and she sent a trainer here. And within about five days, my horses were checking in. It was quite miraculous, Linus. You can't imagine what a shock that was to see, like... It was, ma- it was like magic. It was like all of a sudden these horses were checking in. And um, I started to practice the method and started training under Carolyn and ended up with these amazing Liberty horses. And I knew in that first moment when I started feeling this connection with these horses that I had found my purpose. And it was to share this method because it was transformational and life-changing for me and my horses. It's hard to describe how all of that was, but there's a lot of self-realization and personal growth that comes with being able to connect with horses. So that was kind of what was happening for me. And then, of course, they were gentling and they were like, you know, coming to me and hanging out with me and laying down all around me. And it was amazing. And this path just started spinning. I mean, it was just like all of a sudden I was spending a lot of time in California training under Carolyn. And um, she was very happy with my, you know, ability with horses and we became business partners. And from that moment on, I've been spreading the word of this method to help empower people and transform the lives of horses to give horses a better deal. That's the mission that I feel is my purpose in life. Yep. Yep. There's a lot of, um, lot of people out there that, you know, have a mission similar to that. Yes. But they would have, and, and uh, you know, I've noticed people who work in the horse industry who really, it's not just a job, it's they really work in the horse industry because it's part of their lifestyle. You know, that's what they want to do, and if they can get paid to do it, then that's great as well, okay? Absolutely. But, you know, they're all the same type of person. So I'm thinking core skills and character traits, what do you find that's the similar thread amongst the horse people that want to do this for a lifestyle, not just for a job? I mean, you get paid for it, yes, but, and, and it's often, you know, can be very well paid for it. Um, gosh, that's a little, that's a little tough because it varies so much, but I really just feel it's the passion for the horse. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that most any horse trainer or people in the horse industry that I've met all have the same drive to connect with the horse. There's something about being with the horses that's so rewarding and so healing for us as humans. Even the trainers who might not even be in that scope of horse training, I think that they feel the results of that. And it's just, it's a very rewarding, it can be challenging and then it can be rewarding. And I guess that's what the common thread would be. And most of them that I know all want to give the horses a better deal. So they're trying in their own way, one way or another, to help people be able to overcome being stuck in how to to train or work with horses and be with horses. So do you think that's the empathy? You know, they see things from the horse's point of mm-hmm. view. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I do. Mm-hmm. I absolutely do. And I really think, like, even people that, you know, Like my grandfather, who was a more old-fashioned way of training horses, you know, back in the day, like 50 years ago, you know, still, you know, it was his passion for horses and and his, his connection that he had with the horses that kept him going in that field. To take a horse, to birth a horse, to bring it in 
to a world that can be with another human and love it was just wonderful for him. So I, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. And the people that go that bit further, you know, you said about the challenges, yes. you know, that they, they overcome the challenges, but is it that they overcome the challenges or, or is there something else that you'd like to add there? Um, I don't know that it's about overcoming the challenges. I, I, I don't know. I think it's more about being able to see the growth in something, like taking a horse that might have a lot of fear or have some vices and being able to help the horse work through that is so rewarding. I think it's more about that. It's, it's kind of the same as overcoming the challenges, but I, I think it's more of the reward of being to being able to turn that horse around to being dependable. Sometimes it can be the subtle differences, can't it? You know, that sure. the horse sure. just did something that someone else may not even recognise, but it's like just the subtlest little thing, like just the, you know, the twitch of the ear or the blink of the eye or something that the horse did that just indicated that tiny bit more trust and confidence. Absolutely. And that is what I love so much about this method of horsemanship is because that's what we're working on. You know, we're working on developing what Carolyn calls five heartfelt strengths of connection. And that is to build those core elements that are going to keep a horse solid and be magnetically connected to their human. Yeah. So um, it is the subtleness. It's nuance work, right? So I, yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah. Now, tell us again about the strings of connection. Just And, you know, I don't want you to go through every step because I can invite you back to go, right, you know, this is what we're talking about. But just briefly, tell us about that. Sure, sure. Well, I think before I talk about that, if it's okay with you, I just kind of need to touch on exactly what we do yep. um, before anyone could even understand what that is. And so this this method of liberty training that, I teach that Carolyn developed over, you know, 40, 50 years ago is a method of training where we give the horse a voice. So we, we begin and start the horse without tack because we want to be able to observe the horse and actually see who the horse is and then be able to shape his behavior at liberty. So it gives him a, a chance to be able to say no. And once we do that, then there's certain steps that we go through that we try to bring the horse along in a way that he feels that he is in charge of the training in the beginning. And once you have that, it becomes very easy to shape the horse's behavior to become a dependable horse. And so we work with these five elements. They're the bond, trust, respect, willingness, and focus. And what Carolyn observed in nature, because she studied wild horses, and this is how she developed this method, um, was that all horses in harmony, in a harmonious herd, envelop these five things. And they interact with one another to keep these five things solid in the, in the herd. So when we emulate that, it keeps harmony and it brings magnetic connection between you and your horse. So it's the foundation for performance. It's what we, we say is what we do before we would ever ask the horse to do anything for us is make sure that we have these five strings of connection on the horse in the moment. Just go over them again, the five string, the bond, trust, respect. Sure. Yeah. The bond, which we, um, we develop through sharing territory, just spending time with the horse, asking for nothing. Mm -hmm. Trust. Trust as a way of approaching the horse because horses are entitled to their personal space and it allows the horse to trust that you will never enter his personal space without him wanting you to. And the third ritual is respect. And respect is part of a code of conduct of the herd where when a horse asks another horse to move in a harmonious ho herd, that horse will always move. So that's demonstrating respect. The fourth ritual is willingness. And willingness is how, um, well, lead horses lead horses from behind in nature generally. And when a horse accepts your lead, he becomes willing. And it takes dominance out of dominant horses, and it helps horses that are submissive or nervous and timid. It makes them feel like they have more courage. And then the fifth ritual is focus, eye contact. So one of the things that I love about those five elements is if you think about it, there's not one relationship with any animal, human, horse that you could have that if you took out one of those elements that you would have 
a solid, good relationship. And so we work with vibrating between all of those strings of connection all of the time when we're working with the horse at Liberty. Okay. All right. Well, look, I'd like to get you back more to talk about, you know, again, to sure. talk a bit more and a bit more depth about that, Absolutely. Um, Nancy. But we'll move, just move on. And now you've told us about the rescue horses and the, I suppose, you know, even just starting with the first one and then going through and having them. Are they the ones who've influenced you the most and made you the proudest? Absolutely. They, well, I would say that they've influenced me the most because that was really a journey that took me onto the path of what I'm doing today. But the horse I think that, um, that taught me the very most was Pericles. He is a black Frisian that was given to Carolyn and I during COVID um, by a woman who was unable to handle him. And he was a very dominant, aggressive horse. And there were many, many trainers that tried to bring this horse around that could not. And she was shipping them, for, you know, people over from, I mean, flying them over from all kinds of different places, countries, um, to help her with this horse. He was a show horse. And I went to a clinic, a fundraiser clinic at her place, and she started to give me some background, and I asked her not to. I'm like, please don't. I, I just want to work with this horse, just me and him, just the way he is. I don't want any background. And within about the first 30 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes, he and I had this most amazing connection. You cannot believe it. It was like a soul connection immediately. And he was so soft and so amazing And everyone in the audience was crying, and it was just beautiful. It was very emotional. And, you know, I had to explain to everybody, I know the method. I've mastered this method, but it's not me, the great horse whisperer. It's the method. When you can speak the horse's language and communicate with him in this way, there is nothing the horse doesn't want to do for you, and he doesn't feel threatened. That's all it was. It was he knew I could speak his language by the movements and the things that I requested. So he has been, I think, she actually gifted him to me after that clinic. She said that he's definitely my horse. And he is now our exhibition horse, and he is a student horse. He's a big marshmallow, not the big, bad, you know, horse that would beat up other horses and not not do anything for humans. And he's amazing. So I think he influenced me the most because the softer I got, the the, the deeper the relationship grew and the better um, horsemanship came from this horse. It was amazing. Yeah, I love stories like that. Love it. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, he was on his last chance for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, this one might be not so much a question for you, although a question for you if you need to, um, maybe something that Carolyn's told you, but, you know, she's been working with this 50 years, and there's been a lot of advancements with, you know, equine science in the areas that you're talking about, you know, working with horses rather than having horses work for us, okay? But 50 Mm -hmm. years ago, she would have got a lot of flack, wouldn't she? No, and that's what's so amazing. She was the pioneer. Uh, Oh, you mean flack for being so in this way that she is? Absolutely, yeah, Yeah, being different, you know? Yeah. Yes, people thought it was woo-woo, I think, for sure. Yes, Back then, I think people... Well, you know, I don't know if I have time to tell the little story about oh, how tell it us, actually tell came us. to be. Yep. Yep. Yeah, well, Carolyn, and I want to because this is her method, and, you know, I feel blessed enough that I was ever able to study under her. But, you know, she actually had an Arabian breeding farm, and, and she was turning out these champion horses that were doing things, you know, and, and they were a lot softer than a lot of other horses. So the Arabian Association back in 1976 actually asked her, like, what are you doing that's so different? Mm. And she was, a, she was a dressage instructor, so she was putting these horses through dressage. And she really couldn't explain it that clearly because it was based on her observations of the three years she spent in nature observing wild horses. She's kind of like the Jane Goodall of horses, Right. She immersed herself in the culture of horses and learned and started interacting with her horses as a young girl differently. So what happened was, um, and she wrote a book, Naked Liberty, on the subject. So it's a beautiful memoir. But she actually then came up with the water holder tools, which is what we teach now from that Arabian association asking her how she did it. She said, okay, bring all the horses that, um, that are, have problems that are dangerous or whatever 
and I will show you what I do. So she kind of invented the water holder tools for that clinic and walked people through these different steps. And just, it kind of put her on the map. Everybody just got really excited. And then she coined the term Liberty Training. She registered it. And it was way before her time. So yes, a lot of people still to this day don't know what Liberty Training is. But when people see her working her magic with a horse or see me in a clinic with these horses that I don't know that people say are so aggressive, it's miraculous um, to see the shift in a horse just from him knowing that you understand how to communicate with him. So, yes, when you asked, did she get a lot of flack? I don't think it was flack. I think people just thought she was woo-woo, and that's the word that we yeah. always say. <laughs> it's flack know? like an Australian term, is it, when I said a lot of flack? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, okay, maybe not. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did people think she was woo-woo? So, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what's funny is for years, you know, she and she's an amazing horseman with tack, in the saddle, I mean, everything – but she specializes in liberty training because she believes it's the only way to be fair to a horse is to start that way. And, um, but now, now everybody's doing it and everybody's on the, the bandwagon of it, you know, when 50 years ago she had been doing this all along. I think it's really cool. It's, yeah. it's amazing that she could have put this together, you know, just from watching horses, to, to be honest. Okay. And I like that she, you know, she was a dressage trainer and she said, this is what I want to do. Yeah. 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 Well, she found that it gave her better performance. So that's something I didn't say. When you start a horse at Liberty like this, she did it as the baseline for performance. So what happens is the horse then is magnetically connected to you and is willing to do what you ask. So it brings better performance. It takes a lot of training off the other side. So if she was to take a horse, right, and do it her way and put the Liberty on it first and then bring to the saddle and somebody else did it the other way, she would do it. She would be able to get connection and better performance faster mm-hmm, mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. she has the connection. Yeah. So when you get people come in, you know, um, do the training, whether it's with you, whether it's with Carolyn, What's a common fault that you see again and again and again and again? You know, something that you'd see with the way the horses are handling, are being handled, the mindset, the, it's something that you want to say, well, this is what I usually teach first. Yeah. Well, um, there's two things that came that popped in my mind. First, people who think that they know liberty are usually treat training liberty. So the horse is just doing the, um, whatever he's doing for the tree. So there's no real connection behind that, okay? The second thing is that a lot of times the horse, once the person takes the tack off the horse, the horse doesn't want anything to do with them. And they think that they have this amazing connection with their horse because they do a lot of natural horsemanship or they do other things where they have this amazing stuff going on. But when they remove the tack, then the horse is far away. It's very sad. I've seen it in almost every single clinic because the people really do think that they have this amazing heart connection. But quickly, because they do have a bond with the horse, because they spend a lot of time with the horse, quickly when they start to practice this method in the clinic, the horse will come around and they can get the connection. But it is the biggest fault that I see is that people are teaching patterned trained liberty and that they're doing liberty like further in their training instead of starting it in the beginning. And then they realize, wow, if I had just started this way, it would have been so much easier Mm. because the horses want to please us, right? And when you put tack on them, they automatically, they give, you know, it's kind of like Stockholm syndrome, right? They fall in love with their captor. They give up. You know, you've seen that probably that viral picture going around of a horse tied to a plastic chair and they never move. They could drag the chair anywhere, (laughs) Mm. but they're Mm. tied, you know? Mm. So it's, it's mostly that, I think. Now, you've talked about the book, Naked Liberty. Is there another book? Is that the main book that you think is, uh, has she written any books or, you know, any other books that you'd like that are relevant? That's the main one? Yeah, well, that's her book. And so it's her memoir. And I absolutely love that book. If I had to recommend any book, there's tons of books out there that are great books um, about horsemanship. But um, for me, that's, of course, my favorite book. And, um, you know, I don't make anything off of it. I'm not trying to sell it. I just, it's an amazing book. And it actually explains her journey. So it's, um, it's a cool story of, you know, how she got to here, where she is today. 
All right. So moving forward then, what are you looking forward to? Gosh, well, I'm really looking forward to, I, I, I have a beautiful place in Costa Rica. I have a ranch on Lake Arenal in the Arenal Volcano here. Mm-hmm. And um, I spent a year in the United States during COVID because we couldn't, fl- they weren't flying planes into Costa Rica. So we, my husband and I have been now back a year and we have built a retreat center here in that year. And I'm just starting my retreats. And so this season is really exciting for me because I'm, I've always done retreats here, yep. but never where they could stay, stay on my land. So I'm excited that we can immerse people in the nature here in the rainforest and they can be with my horses and really learn a different way to be with horses. So that's what I'm looking the most forward to. All right. Now, Nancy, if people would like to contact you about the retreats, because they sound wonderful, how long do they yeah. go for? Well, it can be any amount of time. I do a lot of private retreats and always have, but these retreats are generally about a week. So okay. some people can only come three days. We book three days for them, but I do custom uh, all-inclusive retreats as well mm-hmm. as group retreats that are set days. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So if they'd like to contact you about the retreats. They can contact me at nancy at resnickmethod.com or they can go right to our website um, under the contact us link on uh, carolynresnick.com and they can find me that way too. Perfect. Yeah. It, it sounds wonderful going for a retreat with horses, Costa Rica. Sounds there wonderful. Go, and a, <laughs> and there's a, you know, I'd love to. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, we're, you know, we're opening up. We're doing a lot more travel now, aren't we? You know, just yes. now that yes. now that we've sort of, you know, COVID's not over by any means, but we've sort of got a little bit more of a handle, a bit more of an idea about the effects and, and what we can do. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's beautiful. All right, Nancy, obviously I, I'd love you to come back a little bit more and I, again to talk in depth, in depth about, you know, one or two of the things that we've talked about. But for people that would like to do a retreat in Costa Rica or even contact you, because so Nancy, are you happy if people contact you about the, about the chat? Absolutely. If they've got any questions. They can contact me about anything that we're doing. I'd love to share it. And, you know, I do travel worldwide and teach. So, you know, anybody who's interested in that can contact me too. Okay, then. Perfect. All right. So those details, you can go to to Nancy's website, but if you've missed those, of course, they'll be on Horse Chat. So I think if you search for Nancy, you'll get Nancy's Nancy's It Master, and she talked about the Resnick Method. But if you'd like to just go to horsechats.com, search for Nancy, I'm sure you'll find her page. And down the bottom of her page for this chat, there'll be all her contact details. So Nancy, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Looking forward to catching up again. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Not a problem at all. I'll talk to you later. Thank you very much. All Bye-bye. right, Glennis. Uh-huh. Take care. Bye-bye. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please comment, rate, and subscribe. If you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government-accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.